All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Job chapter 4. That's where we will launch out of today. As I was sharing with uh, the underground on Wednesday, I believe that we can suffer through a lot of things. We can go through a lot of things just as long as we know these two things. We, are, we can go through and handle a lot of difficulty in this life as long as we know these two things. Number one, that there is a reason for it. That there is a purpose for it. Nobody likes to suffer in vain. Nobody likes to go through anything just for the sake of going through it. So, number one, as long as we know there's a reason for it, even if it's to, to correct us, even if it's to uh, discipline us, whatever it is, as long as we know there's a reason or a purpose for the pain, we can endure it. And number two, we also want to know that there is an end to the pain. If you know those two things, that there is a reason and a purpose for the pain that you're going through, and that there is an end on the pain that you're going through, then you're more able to go through it. That's why we see on TV and movies, uh, those prisoners, they'll be in their prison cell, and they'll take a calendar, right? <laughs> and they'll begin to X out the days of the week and of the month. Why? Because they're saying, I know why I'm here, <laughs> but if I can just hold on to the end, I can make it through this suffering. And so that's what we want to know when we're going through pain and suffering and discomfort, that there's a reason, there's a purpose, but also there's an end to it. But what do you do when you don't know those two things? <laughs> what do you do when you don't know the reason why you're suffering, the purpose of your suffering, and even if this will ever end uh, at all in my life? Well, that then brings more suffering on top of the suffering you're already going through. And so I believe if we can't get relief from our pain, the least we want to know is why we're going through it, and how long we're going to have to endure it. Hence the name of our series. If you're visiting with us today, Believe Church, we want to let you know we're currently on a series entitled Why. Our series is entitled Why, where we've been attempting to answer the cosmic question concerning suffering. And that simply put is, if God is so good, then why is there so much bad? Why do we see so much bad if God is so good? And not only that, if God is so good, why is there so much bad? But why is there so much bad, especially to the good? Or what or who we would consider to be good? This is the cosmic question or the universal question we all have had or will have in our lifetime. If God is so good, why do we need to suffer? Why is there so much bad in the world? Job has suffered, the Bible says, without cause. He was blameless, he was upright, he was the one who feared God, who shunned evil, but yet no one else other than Jesus Christ suffered without cause like Job has done. Now even though he has suffered without cause, that's not going to stop his friends from speculating. <laughs> that is not going to stop his friends from assuming that Job must have done something to deserve the suffering that he is going through. So what Job is going to have to go through now on top of his suffering, he is going to now be berated with accusations from his friends. It is the complete opposite of what friends are for. I remember in preparing for this message the story of Pat Tillman. You know, remember Pat Tillman. Pat Tillman was a professional football player played for the NFL as a, as a safety, and he was so distraught over the events of 9-11 that he decided to leave the NFL and enlist in the Army. He became an Army Ranger, and he enlisted to fight for our freedom against uh, what just took place during 9-11. And we heard the reports, we heard what he had done, and it was a great American story. I mean, you have this guy, this athlete who loves his country so much, he is willing to leave the sport that he loves, leave the millions of dollars that he was making doing it, simply to go into a foreign land and fight for the freedom of this country. It was a great American story. Because we also discovered that he died while trying to do that. And the first report was that he died in battle. He died in enemy lines, in enemy territory. He died in the line of duty. 
And it wasn't until later on that we found out and discovered that wasn't the case. <laughs> Pat Tillman didn't die in the line of fire. He didn't die uh, behind enemy lines. He didn't die in battle. He died as a result of friendly fire. Friendly fire. It was his own soldier, soldiers that accidentally shot him and took him out. And that's when the story takes a, a dark turn because at first we're thinking, wow, this is a great American story of this guy who uh, left his millions and left the sport he loved to die for our freedom, only to discover it was by the hands of his own soldiers that ended or took his life. It was by friendly fire. And so Job, Job too is about to go through some friendly fire of his own. <laughs> Job is about to go through some friendly fire of his own. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to Job chapter 4. And I've entitled this next installment of our series, Why? Answering the Cosmic Question. I've entitled it, Friendly Fire. Friendly fire. Now, let me give you fair warning. I'm about to summarize a good portion of the book of Job, okay? We're getting into uh, the, the portion of Job where it's, it's known for its poetry, okay? It's the poetic portion of the book of the Bible, like Psalms, like Proverbs. There's a lot of poetry in those books. Well, in Job, is the same way. There is a lot of poetry in in the book of Job, and that's the portion of Job that we've gotten to now. So I'm about to summarize a whole bunch <laughs> of the book of Job. So I'm going to uh, spit some uh, 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 scriptures to you. Probably going to go a little fast, a little quick. You might not have a lot of time to turn to them, but we will have them up here on the screen. And I encourage you to take some notes so you can go back and see whether these things be so or not, okay? Well, after Job curses his birth, remember he, he said... Uh, uh, sits there in silence for seven days, but after that he opens his mouth to curse his birth, but then it's now his friend's turn. Now that Job has had an opportunity to speak his mind, his friends would like to speak their mind. So notice what it says in Job chapter 4 verse 1. It says, Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, Job, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Okay? Remember the late Joan Rivers. The late Joan Rivers, she had a tagline. She had a phrase that she was known for saying all the time. And that was, can we talk? Right? Y'all remember that? Joan would come to her guest. She said, look, can, can we talk? And what she was saying is, do I have permission to speak into your life? Because what I'm about to say, you're not going to like. <laughs> What I'm about to say, you're not going to appreciate. But can we talk? Can I be open? Can I be real? Can I be honest with you? And Eliphaz, Job's friend, is saying the same thing. He is wanting to get permission from Job before he begins his tyrant uh, against him. He says, simply put, if one speaks a word to you, will you get mad? <laughs> will you get upset? Will you get weary? Can we talk? Can I be frank with you about what is going on? Because what I'm about to tell you, Job, you are not going to like. So what is he going to say? What does Eliphaz says? that's the central theme of this entire discussion? Well, verse 7. He says, remember now, whoever perished being innocent. <laughs> Eliphaz is asking Job that question. Job, please tell me, whoever perished being innocent? Innocent. No, no, that's not what happens. It's the guilty who perish. It's the guilty who go through trials and tribulation. He says, or where were the upright ever cut off? Show me in the Bible. Show me in Scripture. Show me in God's Word where that was ever the case, Job. Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble, they reap the same. So what is Eliphaz saying? What he is simply saying is, Job, what did you do? Job, what did you do? You must have done something because nowhere has any innocent man perished. Nowhere have the righteous been cut off from the hand of God. So because you are going through what you're going through, it only stands to reason you 
must have done something. So Job, what did you do? Because you and I both know well that bad things only happen to bad people. You know that. I know that. And so because bad things only happen to bad people and bad things are happening to you, we must conclude you must be bad. <laughs> After all, you are only chastened by God when you are in trouble with God. So Eliphaz is simply saying, Job, what did you do? What did you do? Now, verse 8 in his speech here when he first starts off, Verse 8 sounds familiar to us, right? Talking about reaping and sowing, right? He says, even as I've seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble, they will reap the same. Well, that sounds familiar to us, right? That sounds a lot like Galatians 6, 7. Galatians 6, 7 tells us the exact same thing. Galatians 6, 7 says this, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. <laughs> that is a word of God, that is the principle of the kingdom of God, that whatever you sow, please know that is what's going to pop up out of the ground. That's what you're going to reap. So, Job, because you are reaping this suffering, can only mean it's because you have sown this suffering. You have sown trouble, and now you're reaping it. And then he hits him with this in verse 12 of, of Job 4. He says, now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it. In dis disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair on my body stood up, it stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying. Anybody catch what Eliphaz is saying here? What he is saying here is, God revealed this to me. <laughs> God came to me. Either God came himself, the Spirit of God came to me, or he sent one of his holy angels. But God told me that you must have sinned. God told me that there was iniquity in your life. That's why this has happened to you. You see, when we give a harsh word to somebody, we sound more credible when we say, this is from the Lord, right? <laughs> Brother, I got a word from you. <laughs> the Lord wants you to know something. They're more uh, inept of, of hearing us out and listening to what we have to say if we say it's from the Lord. <laughs> if we say it's just us, they will dismiss it. But if we say, no, God revealed this to me, and now he wants me to tell it to you, they will be more inclined to listen to what we have to say. Which lets us know that just because somebody says they have a word from the Lord, doesn't mean they do. <laughs> just because somebody says they have heard from God, doesn't mean they have. Because we know the behind the scene, right? We already know the story. We know Job has done nothing wrong. But yet, that doesn't stop Eliphaz from saying, God appeared to me in a dream. He came to me and he revealed to me that there is iniquity in your life. And so he uses God in order to attack Job to come clean with whatever he has done. But what he says about man, however, is true. Notice what he says next in verse 17. What Eliphaz says about man is true. He says in verse 17, can a mortal be more righteous than God? In other words, Job, if you're saying, if you're upright, if you're holy, if you're blameless, but yet these things are happening to you, you're saying there is some iniquity with God. You're saying there's some injustice with God, so you would be more righteous than if even God. Well, he asked the question, can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? If he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, the angels that fell and rebelled against him, how much more those who dwell in houses of clay, humans, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed by or before a moth. 
Eliphaz asked Job a question that we still ask today. Right? Eliphaz is asking Job a question that we still even ask today, and that is, why would God allow bad things to happen to good people? That is the million-dollar question that the majority of the world who believes that there is a God or even will use this as proof that there is no God. That's the question they will have. Why do bad things happen to good people? But God has a good response to that, okay? God has a good response to that, and it's a question of his own. When we say, tell God, or say to God, God, how can bad things happen to good people? God's response is, what good people are you talking about? <laughs> what good people <laughs> are you referring to? <laughs> Please tell me what good people are you talking about? You see, if we were to go out and ask anybody who believes in the afterlife, who believes in heaven, not only are you going to heaven, but why are you going to heaven? The majority of the answers that you will get will be the exact same. You go to somebody and say, listen, you believe in heaven? Yes, I do. You believe you're going to heaven? Yes, I do. Please tell me, why do you believe you're going to heaven? Well, because I'm a what? Good person. <laughs> because I am a good person. That's why I'm going to heaven, because I am a good person. Well, God would say, good by whose standard? Huh? Good by whose definition? <laughs> you know, we have 7 billion people on this earth. 7 billion different possibilities of a definition of what it means to be good. Who do you think God's going to use? Whose definition will God use to determine if you're good or not? His own. God is going to use his own definition of what it means to be good to determine whether or not you are good. So you're absolutely right. You must be good in order to go to heaven, but in order to be good, you must be God. Let me show you. Let me prove it to you. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. You remember the story. The rich man comes to Jesus. He wants to know, what must I do to be saved? But it's how he refers to Jesus that gives us our, the point that we're making. He goes to Jesus and he says, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says in response, Mark 10, 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. And that is God. Jesus said no one, I mean no one is good but one, and that is God. Now Jesus, of course, he is God. He wasn't claiming not to be God, what he is saying is, you don't see me as God. How do we know that? Because you called me teacher. <laughs> you didn't call me God. You didn't call me Lord. You called me teacher. So you don't see me as God. So don't call me good if you don't see me as God because there's only one that is good, and that is God. There's only the one that is good is God. In Isaiah 64, 6, you may see, well, wait a minute, I do a lot of good things. I mean, even yesterday, I went downtown, I, I fed the homeless and, and clothed the naked. I do a lot of good things. I give the charity. Well, Isaiah 64, 6 will tell us this. But we are all like, un, like an unclean thing to God. And all our righteousnesses, righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Our most righteous acts, when you compare it to the righteousness of God, is like filthy rags to God. I mean, how dare you come up with all the good things, quote-unquote good things, you have to do and say, God, this is why you should let me into your kingdom. This is why you should let me into heaven, because look at all the things I did. When you compare your righteousness to the righteousness of God, to what Jesus Christ did on your behalf, God says, your righteousness, your goodness is like filthy rags to me. It is rubbish to me. In Romans 7, 18, Paul would say it this way. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, 
nothing good dwells. There is none, no good in me that is in my flesh. Why do you say that, Paul? Why do you say that? Well, go back to Romans 3.23. He says, the reason why I say that is because for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why. The Bible says, all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God, which is perfection. But what does that mean? What does it mean to fall short of God's glory? It means to fall short of his standard. It means to fall short of his requirement. And his standard, his requirement is perfection. That, that's it. God will not take anything less than perfection. And we all have fallen short of perfection. It would be like if somebody were to come in, a gunman were to come in and says, look, I'm killing everybody in here who can't jump up and touch this ceiling. Okay? <laughs> if you can't jump up and touch this ceiling, you're a dead man. I'm killing you. So it doesn't matter that you can jump higher than me. Doesn't matter that you can almost get up there. If you can't touch that ceiling, you're a dead man or woman. God is saying, my standard is perfection. <laughs> and unless you can touch my ceiling, my, my standard, you all fall short of my glory. You all fall short of my standard, my requirement. And every single one of us has done that. In sin, because we've been born in sin, because we manifest the sin, we all have fallen short of God's glory. Therefore, there is none who are good. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I mean, I, I try and keep uh, the, the Ten Commandments, though. I, I try and keep the law uh, as much as I can. Well, you, you broke at least one. That's lying, because there's <laughs> no way. <laughs> A lot of people who even claim that, well, I believe you got to keep the Ten Commandments to go to heaven. They can't even quote the Ten Commandments to you. So how can you be keeping what you don't even know yourself? That's number one. But number two, there's not just Ten Commandments that God has given us. There are 613 different commandments that God has given us in his, in his Bible, in his word. Is there's no way that you are keeping all of God's commandments all the time perfectly. There's no way that you're doing that. You say, wait a minute, I keep a lot of them. I keep most of them. Well, that's just like saying, I almost touched the ceiling. <laughs> I almost got up there. No, James 2.10 says it like this. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in how many points? One. That's all it takes. You manage to keep the entire law of God. You can keep 612 laws and commandments of God, but you stumble in just one. God says you're guilty of them all. You are guilty of all. It's like going to a judge. You, you rob the bank and, and the judge says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to jail. I'm going to throw you in prison. Wait a minute. I know I robbed the bank, but, but I, I didn't murder anybody. I wasn't selling drugs. Well, no, that's fine. <laughs> but it only took one crime for you to become a criminal and go to where criminals go. And in the same way, it only takes one sin for you to become a sinner and go where sinners go. Because God's standard is perfection. So, well, Pastor, you're scaring me here because I know I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm far from it. Does that mean I'm not going to heaven? Well, stay tuned, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the answer. <laughs> I'm going to give you the answer to touching the ceiling. Just stay with me, all right? <laughs> Romans 3.12, therefore, after all that Paul says this in Romans 3.12, therefore, there is none who does good. No, not one. Not one. There is none who do good. No, not one. So when you say, why do bad things happen to good people, God says, what good people you're talking about? Who, who are you referring to when you say good people? <laughs> because there is none that are good according to God's standard. No, not one. So the question is not, why do bad things happen to good people? The question should be, God, how can you allow any good to happen to bad people? That's the question we should be asking. God, we are so bad, we 
are so wretched when we're in comparison to you, how can you ever allow anything good <laughs> to happen to wretched sinners like us? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves in God. And the answer for that is simply because of God's grace, because of God's mercy, because of God's goodness. Not because of your goodness, not because you're deserving of it, not because you've merited anything that God now owes you anything. It is simply because of his mercy, of his grace, and of his goodness being bestowed to you. That is the only reason why good can happen to the bad. I know there's some people that still don't believe that. You say, Pastor, I don't know about y'all. <laughs> I don't know about anybody in this room, but I believe I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I believe I'm pretty good. Like I said, I, I go to work, I pay my taxes, I stay out of trouble, uh, I, I give to charities, uh, I feed the, the naked and, 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 and give food to the homeless. I mean, I do a lot of good things. So I don't know about y'all, but I'm pretty good. And not only that, but I know a lot of atheists. I know a lot of people who don't know God, don't want to know God, don't believe in God, but I too would consider them to be good. Well, there are two reasons why you think that, okay? <laughs> there are two. If you believe that you're still a good person after what I just showed you in Scripture, and you believe other people who don't know God are good people as well, there are two reasons why you think that. Number one, it is because you are comparing you and them to everybody else. That's why you think that. You think you're good, you think they're good, is because you're comparing yourself and them to everybody else. You say, well, I, I'm not a, a, a criminal. I haven't gone to jail like those people I see on the 6 o'clock news. I, I don't sell drugs like I see people on Skid Row and downtown doing drugs and selling drugs. What you're saying is the reason why I feel and believe I am good is because I'm comparing myself with everybody else. Well, guess what? When you stand before God, and you will stand before God, the Bible says we will all stand before God and give an account to God. When you stand before God, God is not going to compare you with everybody else. God is going to compare you to himself. <laughs> Remember, he's the standard. He's the requirement. So he's not going to compare you to your neighbor. He's not going to compare you to your spouse. He's not going to compare you to people on 6 o'clock news and people in prison and people on Skid Row and on the street. He's not going to compare you to them. He's going to compare you to himself. And when you compare yourself to him, you always fall short of his glory. I don't care how good you think you may be. So if you think you're a good person, you think other people who don't know God are good, it is because you are comparing yourself and them to everybody else. Well, please know, everybody else is not the standard. <laughs> okay? Everybody else is not the standard. The second reason, the second reason you may feel that you're still a good person, and other people who don't even know God, they bake cookies for the neighborhood kids and do all these things, are still good people, is because you are looking to action, whereas God looks to the heart. Okay? You look to action. What you do or don't do to determine your goodness, God looks at the heart. Remember when Jesus comes to the people and he says, look, you have heard it said, thou shall not commit murder. Anybody who commits murder is in jeopardy of the judgment. And so all the Pharisees said, look, yeah, we're, we're good. We're good because I've never murdered anybody. But Jesus says, but I tell you this. If you hate in your heart without cause, you have murdered them. If you hate somebody, in other words, you may not have done the act, but if you wanted to, that's all it takes. If you just have the intent to do it, that's all it takes to show you that you are not good, you are not righteous. He says, if anybody, you have heard it said that if anybody commits adultery, then you are in judgment or, or in jeopardy of judgment. But he says, I tell you this. If you look at a woman who is not your spouse to lust after her, in your heart, you have committed adultery. 
in your heart you have committed adultery. Either you've committed adultery to your current spouse or you've committed adultery to your future spouse. <laughs> but either way, you didn't have to go commit the act. You didn't have, for God, you didn't have to go commit the act. It is enough for God to simply want to, <laughs> to have the intent to do it. God was showing you his standard. And he was showing you that there is none who do good, no, not one. Because it's not only about the action, it's about the heart. It's about the intent. You see, the reason why sinners don't do certain things is not because they're good. It's because they don't want the consequences that come with it. See, sinners, they may go to work and they have somebody on their job they cannot stand. I don't like this person. I can't stand them. I wish they were out of my hair, out of this job, out of my life. I wish I could just take them out. And all my problems would go away. I would have an easier time on my job. So let me just take them out. They want to do that, but they don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because they're good? No, it's not because they're good. It's because they don't want to go to jail. <laughs> That's why you don't do it. You don't want the consequences that come with that action. The reason why sinners out there won't commit adultery, won't cheat on their spouse, is not because they're good. It's because they don't want to lose their family. They don't want to go through a divorce. They don't want to lose their children. That's why they don't do what they really want to do. In their heart, they really want to do it. Let me, let me prove it to you. If we could be honest in here, and please don't raise your hand, but if we could be honest here, what if I could assure you, what if I could assure you that no matter what you did, you would never face any consequence for it? What if I can give you that assurance? No matter what you did, you would never, ever face any consequences for it. So you wouldn't lose your job, you wouldn't go through a divorce, you wouldn't lose your family or your children, you wouldn't lose blessing, God would still bless you just like he's always blessed you. You wouldn't have to go to hell. You would still go to heaven. What if I gave you that assurance that no matter what you did, you would never, ever face any consequences for it? What would you do? <laughs> what, what, what would you do if you knew that? That you would never face any consequences for your action? What would you do? Well, you may not do everything, but you probably do something. And like we just got through reading, all it takes is one thing. <laughs> all it takes is one thing. Because the reason, the motivation for why people do what they do or don't do what they do is not because they're righteous, it's not because they're good, it's simply for selfish reasons. Well, they can either get out of it or what they will avoid by not doing that. So by God coming to these people and giving them that, says, no, my God, my Father looks at the heart. Looks at the heart, the intent, the motive, the desire. And if that's there, then you know you're not good. You're not good. No, not one. So this is true of the nature of everyone who has been born. Everybody who's been born of Adam and Eve, this is true of because they simply passed on their sinful nature to their children, and their children pass it on to their children, and on and on and on and on. So if you're here, you've been born, this is true of your nature. Okay? <laughs> this is true of your nature, and that's why you must be born again. That's why you must be given a new nature. But that's not what Eliphaz is referring to. Eliphaz is not referring to Job's sinful nature. Eliphaz is saying, no, it's because of your secret sinful action that, that this has all come upon you. Something that you have done, Job, that you're not confessing, has brought this upon you. And this berating from Job's friends goes on for 25 more chapters. Okay? Now you know why we're summarizing all this. Okay? This berating from Job's friends, this friendly fire, goes on for 25 more chapters. They take turns teeing off on Job. They take turns teeing off on him saying, Job, you need to seek God. Job, you need to repent. Job, you need to embrace God's correction for what you have done. So let me rapid fire the friendly fire for you, okay? We're going to go a little fast.
fast here. Let me rapid fire the friendly fire here for you. Job 8, 4. Notice what he says about his sons and daughters who, who died. In Job 8, 4, his friends say, If your sons have sinned against him, God, he has cast them away for their transgression. If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would have awakened for you and prosper you rightful, uh, prosper your rightful dwelling place. So y'all see what he says there? He says, the reason why your sons and daughters died is because they were sinning. That's why God took them out. That's why God killed them, because your sons and your daughters were sinning. The Bible never says that, though. Bible never says that his children were sinning, and that's why they took him out. But what other conclusion can we come to? God, God wouldn't just do this just to do it, so obviously your children were sinning. And obviously you were sinning because that's why you're suffering now. Because if you were upright and blameless as you claim to be, surely God would have come to your aid by now. Surely God would have come to your rescue by now. But because he has, it means there is some unconfessed sin. Job 11, Job 11 says, Oh, that God would show you the secrets of wisdom, for they would double your prudence. Know, therefore, that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. I know you're saying that you're guiltless, that you're upright, you're innocent, but if God were here, if he were to tell us the truth, he would reveal to us what you've really done and how you are getting off pretty scot-free compared to what you have actually deserved. In Job 22, 4, it says, Is it because of your fear of God that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? That doesn't make sense, Job. You fear God, you shun evil like you claim, but that's why you've entered into his judgment? That doesn't make sense. Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? For you have taken pledges from your brother for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given the weary water to drink and you have withheld bread from the hungry. But the mighty man possessed the land and the honorable man dwelt in it. You have sent widows away empty and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. They're not even accusing anymore. They're blatantly saying, this is what you've done, Joe. <laughs> this is what you've done. This is why this suffering has come upon you. All three friends fire off accusation after accusation after accusation to Job. Telling Job, confess, repent, get right with God so that you may be delivered from this. So how does Job respond to all this? Job 6.14, back up there, Job 6.14. He says, to him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friends. Even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty, my brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away. Say, so y'all came here under false pretenses. I thought y'all were here to comfort me. <laughs> I thought y'all were here to encourage me. I thought y'all were here to lift me up and bear my burden with me. No, y'all came here to accuse me of wrong. Some friends you are. Job 6, 28, now therefore be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. Yield now, let there be no injustice, yes, concede, my righteousness still stands. He says, look at my face, <laughs> look into my eyes. Have you ever been telling the truth? And the person you told the truth didn't believe you? <laughs> I mean, you, you understand the frustration of that. And you say things like, I swear to God, I put my hand on the Bible. I promise you, look at me. <laughs> you are frustrated because you are telling the truth, but yet they still don't believe you. That's Job. Job is saying, fellas, look at me. Look in my eyes. Look at my face. I would not lie to you. My righteousness still stands. But yet they did not believe their friend. They said, no, you must have done something, Job. Not only does Job begin to bring defense with his friends, but even with God. In Job 7.20, he goes to God and says, God, have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? 
Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? If I have sinned against you, God, why don't you reveal that to me and I repent? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Take it away. Why do I have to continue in this way? Then he turns back to his friends in chapter 16, verse 2, and says, I've heard many such things, miserable comforters you all are. <laughs> you call yourself friends, miserable comforters you are all. And then in 1920, chapter 19, verse 20, he says, How long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with these words? He's saying, stop, stop already. I cannot take much more of this. I cannot take much more of this friendly fire. I'm already suffering enough as it is with the loss of my children, the loss of my livelihood, the loss now of my health. Now on top of all of that, I got to hear you accuse me of sin. Accuse me of doing something deserving of this. Now in, in retrospect, as we go through the story, just like with Job's wife, Job's friends are usually presented in a negative light. They're presented in a negative, not negative light, but you have to understand, even though their approach was bad, their approach was wrong, their intentions were good. Okay? They loved their friend. They wanted their friend to be better, to do better, to get right. And so you need friends like that, somebody who will be open and honest with you and tell you the truth. Okay? You need friends like that. Don't hang out with people who only tell you what you want to hear. Don't do that. Don't go to a church that's only going to tell you what you want to hear. Don't do that, okay? You need somebody in your life that is willing to get in your face and tell you the truth. The problem, though, with they had, though, they didn't know the truth. <laughs> they didn't know the truth. They were bringing up accusations of what they thought was true. No, please don't get me wrong. If you know your friend, your family member has sinned, is sinning, no, you need to go to them. You need to tell them. You need to confront them. You need to have them get things right with God. But they didn't know that. And so that's where the error came on their behalf. But their intentions, they were good. They were simply under the impression, as many people are, that bad things only happen to bad people. Well, how does this end? Not only... Bad things, quote-unquote bad things, happen to, quote-unquote, good people. Did you know good things happen to bad people? <laughs> Did you know that? And that, that, that's something that frustrates the Christian as well. That not only do bad things happen to good people, but good things <laughs> happen to bad people. This is the same way in Job's day, too. Watch what he says in verse 21-7. He said, Lord, why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and harp and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave without suffering. Yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not des desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to Him? There's nothing more frustrating to the Christian, <laughs> nothing more frustrating to the believer, than to look out and see the wicked prosper. Have you ever been frustrated and upset about the wealth of the wicked? Seeing these people who not only don't know God, but blatantly mock God. They will stand in, on TV in front of a camera and begin to mock God, make fun of God, make fun of Christians, but yet they have money, they have power, they have fame, they have fortune, they are wealthy, they are healthy. It seems like everything good goes for them. 
And we as Christians who love God, who serve God, who worship God, who try and do everything right, we are the ones who are suffering through this life. And you'll be honest and say, yes, that has brought frustration to me like nothing else has ever had. Well, it was the same way with Job. He said, God, how can you treat the righteous this way, but yet the unrighteous, the wicked, get off scot-free? Well, you must understand this about God, that we are in the dispensation of grace. Okay? The dispensation of grace that means that God's word says he allows his grace to shine upon the just and the unjust. Upon the righteous and the wicked. <laughs> upon the saint and the sinner. You see, the reason why hell is going to be hell for those there is because you won't get any of that. Right now, the worst sinner can still experience something from God. Because we're in the dispensation of grace. But in hell, when all that comes to end, that will not be the case. But for right now, yes, sinners may prosper. Sinners may be wealthy. Sinners may be healthy. But that doesn't mean that God is unjust or there's some wickedness with God. Because he also says, Jesus also said this, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his soul? So yeah, if the, the sinners who reject God, reject Jesus Christ, you better live it up. <laughs> you better enjoy it as much as you can. Because <laughs> once this is said and done, it's over. <laughs> what does it profit you to gain the whole world? And that's why I don't understand people who would leave the faith, leave Christianity to pursue the things of this life. Even if you can be rich and wealthy and famous and prosper beyond your wildest dreams. Is a hundred years in comparison to all of eternity worth it to you? Oh. I remember that movie, um, God's Not Dead. This is the conversation they had, the, the, the praying mom, the, the righteous mom and her, uh, her son who uh, just made fun of her. Said, how can you do that? You've been praying to this God and you're here, you're sick, you're out of your mind. He's not done nothing for you. Here I am, and I'm happy, I'm wealthy, I'm rich, I got all these things and friends and pleasure and all. And she says to him, well, sometimes Satan will make the jail cell comfortable, so you'll never want to leave it. <laughs> sometimes Satan will do that. He will make the jail cell as comfortable for you as he possibly can, so you will never want to leave it. So don't be envious of the wicked. Don't be envious of the unrighteous, the sinner who don't know God, but yet it seems like they have all the world. Don't be envious of them. Because it could be that, that Satan has simply made their jail cell as comfortable as they could, as he could. So they would never want to leave it and eventually perish by it. So let's get to the end here. I just want to give you a couple of takeaways, and, and we're, we're done now. Let me just give you a couple of takeaways because there are some key scriptures, key nuggets in the book of Job that I don't want to just simply pass over without getting to. I believe this, the, the first takeaway is this, the righteous are righteous regardless. Okay? The righteous are righteous regardless. Whether you're going through things or you're not, whether you got money or you don't, whether you're suffering or, or not, the righteous are righteous regardless. Job said this in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. I don't understand why God is doing this. I don't understand why God is allowing this. But though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Job 19.25a, he says this. I don't know a whole lot of what's going on, but I know this. My Redeemer lives. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I may not know what's going on, why it's going on, why it's happening. But I know this, that my Redeemer lives. And in verse, uh, chapter 27, verse 3, he says, As long as there is breath uh, in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. 
No, I'm not going to take the plea deal. I'm not going to say, you're right, maybe I did do something. No, I will not lay hold, uh, let go of my integrity. So I believe what God wants us to know today is this. Number one, we need to know how to fight through friendly fire. We need to know how to fight through friendly fire. There will be a lot of people who come to you and try and speak into your life and, and say, I got a word from you from the Lord and all that. You need to know how to fight through that. And allow your righteousness and your integrity to stand before God and God alone. But also, I believe God wants us to, to know that we shouldn't be so quick to fire at our friends. Don't allow the source of friendly fire to be coming from you. Don't assume that you know what's going on. Now again, if you know what's going on, if you know there's sin there, yes, for the sake of your friend and for the sake of the kingdom of God, Yes, confront them about that. But if you don't know, don't be so quick to assume. Right? As it's been said, better for people to think you're not a good friend than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Okay, So if you don't know what to say, just keep your mouth closed. Okay, Just say, I I'm here for you. <laughs> let's, let's get through this together. If you don't know, if you don't know, and, and the only way that you could know it is that you were there, or they revealed it to you. If that's, if that's not the case, though, just be a friend. Be a friend, all right? 